Valley Church. Hope for those who have given up on church. Hi, folks, and welcome to the Freedom Valley Show. Thank you so much for watching. We're in a series we're calling Passion right now. We're talking about becoming people of uh, energy and passion about the things of God. And I, I'm so glad that you're joining us for this. Love to hear from you during this. If you'd like to write me, you could write jerry at freedomvalley.org or you can write the church, Freedom Valley Church, 3185 York Road, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, 17325. Thanks so much for watching. And if you write, thanks for writing. God bless you. Hi, folks. Good to be with you again today. And today we're talking about thoughtful passion as we enter our passion series where we talk about uh, people becoming uh, high energy for God and focusing themselves on what God is doing in their lives and on the uh, ability to get things done for him. And we're talking about passion, being a person of energy and vitality in the kingdom of God. I want to go to Matthew 17 with you in just a little bit. Matthew chapter 17. If you want to find that on your device or in your Bible, that would be great. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation if you want to join with me. That would be wonderful. Have something funny here from Barb Dauber. She sent me this one. She said, One Sunday morning, a mother went in to wake her son and tell him it was time to get ready for church. To which he replied, I'm not going. Why not? She asked. Well, I'll give you two good reasons, he said. Number one, they don't like me. And number two, I don't like them. His mother replied, I'll give you two good reasons why you should go to church. Number one, you're 49 years old, and number two, you're the pastor. So there you go. If you've ever struggled with going to church, there you go. There's a pastor who struggled with it as well. And we're going to Matthew 17 today as we talk about the passion, uh, that uh, the whole passion series, and especially about thoughtful passion today, about uh, learning how to be a person who is thoughtful in our uh, energy for God. I want to read Matthew chapter 17, starting at verse 1. I'm going to read 16 verses, so it's a good bit, but it's really powerful in how Jesus unpacks passion in his life. Six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, and led them to a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. If you want, I'll make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But even as he spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son, who brings me great joy. Listen to him. The disciples were terrified and fell face down on the ground. Then Jesus came over and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus. As they went back down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Then his disciples asked him, Why do the teachers of religious law insist that Moses, that Elijah I'm sorry, must return before the Messiah comes? Jesus replied, Elijah is indeed coming first to get everything ready. But I tell you, Elijah has come, and he wasn't recognized, and they chose to abuse him. And in the same way, they will also make the Son of Man suffer. Then the disciples realized he was talking about John the Baptist. At the foot of the mountain, a large crowd was waiting for them. A man came and knelt before Jesus and said, Lord, have mercy on, me, on my son. He has seizures and suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. And so I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. Well, as we, as we get to talking about passion today, I want to uh, say this. Passion is what happens when you have built into your heart a, a high energy for God. But it happens well when you've built into your heart a high energy for God that is carefully thought through. And I'm talking about thoughtful passion today. How to become a person of thoughtful passion. 
Here's a place where Peter got it a little wrong. Just a little, I suppose. He was able to receive correction, and he did so, as Jesus said right back to him, as the, uh, the Heavenly Father said right back to him in words that he could understand exactly what to do. But he almost missed God's provision and plan here, or at least what God wanted to do on this mountain with him, because of his thoughtless passion. And I want us to become people of thoughtful passion in 2015, people whose hearts are tuned into and passionate about the things of God, where we have become people of high passion for him. We've chosen this to be the year of passion at Freedom Valley, the year of of being high energy for God, of being focused on who he is, and really about what he's about. Now, this is not about memorizing certain religious cliches or learning how to do the religious stuff better or more. Not at all. It's about becoming people after God's heart, and that's what I want to focus on. I want you to notice in verse 4, Peter exclaimed, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. If you want, I'll make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. So what happens is Jesus picks Peter, James, and John, and he takes them up in the high mountain, and, and his face got bright and brilliant, and his face and his clothes got white. And he started uh, talking to the figures that appeared to him, which were clearly Moses and Elijah. And... Uh, the disciples needed a response. There needed to be something said here, it seemed like. And Peter piped up and he said, Lord, it's so wonderful to be here. Let's make three shelters. I got to tell you, when I see this, I feel like it's some of us with our religious side kicking in. We want to stay exactly where we are, especially if it's good. So if we've had a great religious experience, if we've had a, a great time with God, we want to stay right here in this moment. Let's not grow beyond this, we say to each other. Let's not uh, reach one more person. Let's not mess this up. This could be great. Let's build a shelter here and stay forever. You know, our ability to get religious is maybe the most predictable thing about the human experience. Maybe it's something Satan has done in us, or does. Maybe it's something humans choose, but we have this knee-jerk reaction toward a religious experience all over the place. What I mean here by religion is that we want a... We want a system that doesn't change. We want something in our lives that stays the same. And we want to pick what it is. Peter wanted to choose, and he just blurts right out, God, let me build three shelters here, one for Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah. I want to build these three shelters right now. Um, the wrong part about this is, he just wanted to stay. Now, what Jesus knew needed to happen was they needed to leave the mountain. They needed to go back down and find this father who was concerned about his boy. So I read those verses for you where they go back down off the mountain. And here's a, here's a dad who says, Jesus, help me. Your disciples couldn't help me. Please, please help me. My son throws himself into the fire, into the water, and I need help for this. It was Peter just wanting to stay on the mountain because he had a great experience there. Listen, we have this, we have a huge penchant within us to find something good that happened and stay. We just want to live in it. We want to be here forever. We want it to always be this way. We want to never change, never become something useful. It is um, us wanting to celebrate what happened rather than what changed. Can I tell you that something changed in Jesus this day? He spent time with Moses and Elijah, and he learned about interacting with people perhaps he, 
he took counsel of them. I don't know exactly what happened. We're not, we're not given much privy to that in terms of the text. But we do know he met with them. And Peter wanted to stay in the midst of this forever. You know, humans, we, we just want to stay. We want to live in the reality of what we had. We would like it to always be the same forever. The problem is if it's always the same, we're the first ones not to like it. We're the same ones who say, but the children and the youth are leaving. But the young people don't want to be here. But we're not connecting with anybody. But we don't see miracles anymore. We complain because we've kept it the same and God has moved. You know, God is a changing, forceful God where he... Uh, continues to move in the lives of people in so many great ways. And he wasn't about to stop here, live on this mountain, stay on this mountain, shelters on this mountain. Are you kidding me? None of that was okay. Uh, it's odd how we get automatically religious. We are willing to settle and stay in the place where something great happened, if necessary, forever. We want it to be just like it was when we were kids. We want it to be just like it was perhaps when we felt more vital. We want it to be just like it was maybe like in the days when we were taking over. I don't know what it, what it is, but something about us is willing to get religious, to build shelters here, to stay right here forever and ever. And it's, it seems to be what uh, Peter wanted. So religion is a system of do's and don'ts, and that doesn't seem to be what Jesus is about at all. He's not about creating systems or, or just about putting us in a, in a box where we will always stay the same on the same mountain. He's about the movement and the regeneration and the empowerment that comes. And so uh, he doesn't want us to just stay in one place, but continually grow and mature and become full of him in everything that we are. Um, we need to become full of the pattern of thinking that invokes the protection of God and, uh, and, and works on relationship with him, where we're constantly working toward him and being with him. Uh, everyone around us might beg the question, why not just stay? We've got it good here. The problem with that is you cannot stay anywhere. Life moves, life changes, and you got to be willing to move on with God to where he goes with you. To have the passion of God in you is, the, is a passion to grow and a passion to change and a passion to be molded into who he is, not to stay the same. Nobody stays the same in this thing. So God never asks us to get religious or to support religion or, 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 or to be a religious person. He asks us to be somebody who does one simple thing, and that's what the voice says next. And I want you to notice, about the, notice that next in this passage. It says in verse 5, Even as Peter spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dear loved son, who brings me great joy. Listen to him. Now, the voice fixed Peter's issue, and the voice fixed it in one simple way. He said, uh, Peter, this is all about my son Jesus. I love what he's doing. Listen to him. You know, if the Holy Spirit would say one thing to Christians today, it would be listen to Jesus. Listen to him. Carefully hear what he has to say. Think a lot about what he was and what he is and what he's becoming inside of you and listen to him. So the, the voice said just that. I want you, Peter, to hear my son Jesus because I love him so much. I'm greatly pleased with him. He will tell you what to do. He'll show you what to do. He'll walk with you. Listen to him because that's what it's all about. And so if, if you have, maybe you're at a place where you've lost the voice of God in your life. You've lost that understanding of who God is or where he is. 
here's what he would say to you. Go back to that place where you've heard Jesus' voice and do what he says. Jesus will always lead you right. He will always give you the very best in your life. He will always provide abundantly for you. Listen to him. If you listen to him, you won't get distracted by religion or by staying anywhere on any mountain, by building three shelters or whatever. You'll simply do what he says. And what Jesus says to us is very, very simple. Care about each other. Care about God. That's what it's about. That's what he is about. And it's what he will say. So uh, our focus and energy and direction always need to come from Jesus and be given back to him. Our focus needs to be on him. Not on the people around him. On him. Not on uh, every other invention of God's, but on him. He is our subsistence. He is our creator. He created us. He invested in us. He died for our sins. And now wants us to, sim to do one simple thing. Be somebody who listens carefully. So here's how the voice fixed it. He said, the voice said, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Saying, I, I want you to be people who carefully and deeply hear the voice of Jesus in everything you do. Be about Jesus. Follow Jesus. Because it will change your life to do that. Uh, we need to meditate on him. We need to think about him. We need to dwell on him. We need to be people who become experts in Jesus in every possible way. And people who uh, listen to his voice in times of crisis or direction, whatever it is. We need to be people who hear Jesus everywhere and listen to his voice. If there's change, interruption, or adjustment, we need him. We need to know what he's doing and what he's saying and what he's about. Because everything about the Christian life, it's called Christian because it's like him. We're being like him, like Christ. That's what Christian means, to be more like him, to be a little example of who he is in our lives. And what the voice from heaven said to Peter is just simply that. This is my beloved son. I want you to follow him more than anything else. I love that God the Father said this over his son. You know, dads, I think every son needs to hear this. Every son. You know, we leave a legacy for our kids in a lot of ways. How about if we start today leaving a legacy for our children and, and writing a word of encouragement to them that can be read as they open our will? How about if we begin to leave a word of encouragement for our kids that, that says essentially, this is my beloved son. I love him. Listen to him. Isn't that what God said to his boy? And wasn't he modeling for us something that we could do? Every boy needs to hear that. Every boy on earth craves to hear that. I often tell the story of how it seemed like for years I didn't feel like I got that from my father. But I did uh, my niece's funeral when she died at 26 years old and full of Jesus and, and uh, a great kid. I, I was honored to be asked to speak at her funeral and had just had a few choice words and uh, wrapped it up with an altar call. Many, many, many people came to Christ that day. And afterward, I'm sitting with my father outside of that church and people are streaming out. I'm sitting with my father on a nice... Um, lawn chair outside of that church and an old man totters up to us and he taps my father's foot with his cane and he says I bet you're proud of your son today weren't you I can hardly even say that without getting choked up it means so much to me that that old man would think that way about me and then my father's response was yeah I guess I am that was huge in my life, so incredibly huge to hear these words from my father. This is my boy, I like him. He's doing all right. That matters. And fathers, as a whole secondary thing, this is what our children need to hear from us. They need our voices to say, 
this is my boy and I love him so much and I'm invested in him. I care deeply about him. He matters to me. Listen to him. So the father guides us back to Jesus and focuses on him, everything about him. God is extremely pleased with him. This is a, our heavenly father saying, I like what my boy is doing. I like what he's teaching. I like what he's about. And I think everybody should listen to him. Every boy needs to hear that from his father so, so much and so deeply all the time. Uh, God is extremely pleased. And uh, then I want you to notice verse 10. Then his disciples ask him, Why do the teachers of religious law insist that Elijah must return before the Messiah comes? You know, the disciples had another question here. It doesn't say who asked it, but somebody came up with a better question, a better statement, a better reality to live in than we ought to just stay on this mountain instead of going down to meet the father and his boy, instead of getting involved in people's lives. We ought to stay on this mountain. And uh, now they have the, the voice from heaven got to them. The voice said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. So they started listening. And they heard out of Jesus' heart a, a better question for him. And the better question was, why do the teachers of religious law insist that Elijah must return before the Messiah comes? Now the disciples are thinking more carefully about their passion. They've had a little time. They've had a little uh, opportunity to think this through. And in the pensive moment, it feels like, they are saying to Jesus, can you help us understand this whole thing? The, the whole religious world is saying that um, Elijah needs to return before the Messiah comes. What does that mean? Is Elijah really coming back? Jesus says, no, but Elijah has come back. It's not like you're thinking like Elijah's going to, rise up from the dead and become clothed in flesh again and become this person. It's that a person, it means a person like Elijah is coming. And he started talking about John the Baptist at that point. I want you to notice that the whole, that when they got focused on Jesus, the whole question changed. Everything about their lives changed, especially what they wanted to know. And they started asking him, okay, Jesus, talk to us about Elijah coming back and he had an answer for them what you're missing here he said is you thought of Elijah as a real person when Elijah is actually John the Baptist and he has come back already and is already among you that's what he was saying and so uh, what, what I get out of this is the Holy Spirit is saying how would your question change if you really followed Jesus if you became somebody who seriously sincerely Followed the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords with all of your heart. How would your questions change about him? What would it change about what you care about in life? What really deeply matters if you took this voice seriously that came from heaven that said, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. What would change about what matters to you? Because the apostles here had a, had a change in what they were thinking and how they were thinking and and now it came down to asking a real question about a reality that they were facing rather than a presupposition about building some kind of shelters there on the mountain. They started saying, okay, Jesus, help us understand. There's something about your life that we're not getting. Help us get it. Help us deeply get this so that we can understand everything about who you are. And in very quickly, in very simple terms, he quickly explained and described to them what had already happened in front of them. So how would your question change? If you had a chance, if you were really deeply focused on Jesus, how would your question change about him? Would you become somebody who suddenly stops caring about what that person said about you? or whether those people like you, or whether that situation is turning into your good, could you really become about Jesus again? 
that it seems like that's what happened to the disciples. Their question changed. It changed how they were looking at life, how they were going about life, what mattered in life. All that changed because they simply spent time in the presence of Jesus, thinking deeply about their passion. You know, it's, it's impossible not to say that the disciples were deeply passionate about Jesus. They loved him enough to leave their lives and follow him. And so they were passionate about him throughout. But Peter had to come off with this statement saying uh, about building the three shelters. He totally missed the mark. He needed the voice from heaven to come and say, listen, follow Jesus. Simply follow him. Trust him with your whole life. Give him everything. Show him that you care deeply about him and watch what he'll do for you. He will pour back the blessing of God into your life in so many ways. You won't be able to contain it if you trust him. How would your question change? What about your context would you see differently, completely differently, if you had an opportunity to hear his voice and you heard the father say, this is my boy. I want you to listen to him and carefully. What would change about you? Because they changed and, and wanted to know very simple, straight up things. They changed in that they were willing to get into the second thing. was They were willing to get into the battle again. They were willing to face this guy who said, hey, master, talk to me about my son. Your disciples couldn't help him. I need help. Now Jesus says, all right, I got help for you. I know exactly what you need. And uh, cast demons out of him. By the way, it, it doesn't indicate that he cast them out quickly. It took a little time, took a little care, but he did. And so Jesus was focused on that moment, focused on what he could do to survive, focused on what it took for them to also survive and do well in it. Listen, if you will follow Jesus today carefully, and with your whole heart, he will make your life become as great as the disciples. He wants more leaders. He wants more men and women who are willing to step up to the plate and do the right thing, do the great thing for him. And you could be one of those today. You could start that today. If your question changed, if you became somebody who became very thoughtful in your passion and very wholesome in it to where you were asking him the questions he wanted you to ask and the questions he was happy to answer rather than the question, the statement like Peter made that he simply ignored. He answered this question because it came from a sincere heart. It was about them asking something deeply and honestly of him that he could answer. And so he gave them an answer that was useful and that, that uh, they were looking for, that they could respond to uh, because there was that opportunity there and the passion of God was burning through all of them at that point, a thoughtful passion, a carefully uh, crafted passion. Listen, this is the year of passion at Freedom Valley, and I pray it's the year of passion in your life that you're somebody who knows how to become passionate about the things of God at the right moment, powerful in word and deed. You're willing to help out the father with the son who falls into the fire of the water. You're, you're willing to go into the battle and make a difference wherever people are. And you're uh, passionate for God to do it in all of those places. Thank you so much for watching today. God bless you. Thanks, folks, for watching, for being a part of this. I appreciate that so much. Again, I'd love to hear from you. You could write the church at Freedom Valley Church, 3185 York Road, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, 17325. Or you can write me on my email address, jerry at freedomvalley.org. Either way works fine. Thank you so much for being a part of this and for watching our show today on passion. God bless you.